Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Will the delegate from Culpeper rise for a question? Will the delegate yield? I'll yield. The delegate yields. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I agree with something that the delegate said, that in the simplest model of any competitive market, that the market clears when the equilibrium price is equal to the cost of the product. In the case of a labor market, when the workers are paid their marginal product. But in the last 40 years, we know that the hourly productivity of American workers has grown four times faster than their hourly wage. So Mr. Speaker, I would ask the delegate, how would he explain why he clings to a simple competitive model of a labor market in the face of that evidence to the contrary? Mr. Speaker, that's an excellent point. And when we look at just real wages, there's a lot of truth to what the delegate just said. However, when we look at total compensation across the board, what we find is they never get another government intervention into the negotiating process between an individual labor and their employer. Because instead of this being something where we allow the employer and the, and the um, employee to negotiate the terms of what their benefits package looks like or how much money they're going to get paid per hour or what sort of work they're going to do, too often the government has intervened in the process and decided that, no, we're going to mandate all of these things. Well, every time you mandate another requirement, every time you assume for yourself the right to negotiate on behalf of the people seeking the job, you are essentially cutting back from what they can potentially get in real wages. And again, we can have a debate all day long about whether or not we think that's beneficial, but I will once again say that I think it's somewhat arrogant for us to assume that we should negotiate on their behalf, especially to the point where we're essentially engaging in price fixing within the labor market and telling someone that wants a job, that may need a job, that may have found a job, they're not allowed to have it unless we've approved of what their wage is going to be. And again, I don't think that's an appropriate intervention into that negotiation, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, speaking to the bill at the appropriate time. Delegate has the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I agree with the delegate from Culpeper about something else, that it's not the book of Matthew that tells us why the minimum wage doesn't hurt low-wage workers. It's the book of Joshua and of David, not the prophets, but Joshua, Angus, and David Card. They were awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics last year for 30 years of work establishing that the predictions that raising the minimum wage lowers net income from low-wage workers just don't pan out in practice. Now, their names are known to economists like me nationwide, but I have the extraordinary privilege of knowing them well. Dr. Angris was my thesis advisor at MIT. And what he taught me is that you need a little bit more than Economics 101 to understand the consequences of a policy like this for the people that we serve. You see, Bio 101 isn't enough to make a doctor, and you can't build a bridge with Physics 101 alone. So too with economics. There is friction and inertia and leverage in the tug of war between business owners and workers and the customers they serve. And that sometimes, in the face of a non-competitive market, there is scope for government to intervene and level the playing field and generate gains for the greater good of all. Now, Mr. Speaker, long before I was a professor of economics, I was just another preacher's kid, like Delegate Graves and a lot of other people in this world. And that's where I studied the book of Matthew and how we serve the least of these, the people who need us most. And now that I'm both a preacher's kid and a professor of economics, I understand even better that that simple belief that raising the minimum wage hurts workers is an article of faith, not an economic fact. And while we here in this body abide by the statute on that wall that says that we can all worship however we want, I would simply ask that we each do it in our own names for our own profession. As for me and my house, we've already shown where we stand by the highest honor we have. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs>